Hello. Tall blonde in front. <laughs> so you guys ready for a little endodontics? Yeah, all right, come on, yeah. Rock and roll, endodontics, okay? So um, what we're gonna be doing here in terms of endodontics is I'm gonna be talking to you about the bioceramic technique. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about the bioceramic technique, and most importantly, I'm gonna talk about this as the real story. Um, this is a technique that's become pretty much the new gold standard in obturation. Not standard of care, but the gold standard. And now there's a whole host of different people laying claim to developing this technique. And um, it's fun for me because I'm gonna show you how this technique was developed and how this entire thing came about. Well, you know, I um, haven't had a chance to show you anything about what it looks like where I come from. This is my house in the winter, okay? That's um, kind of desolate, frozen in. And um, when I took this picture, it was really kind of interesting because there was a, I, I looked out my window and uh, I have a big tripod with a binoculars and I looked out on the ice and I was like, what the heck is that? It looked like a wolf. It was a big coyote out in the ice. So I don't know what the coyote, the coyote is gone here when I took the picture, but I don't know what the coyote was doing. But um, that's Nantucket Sound out there. It's pretty desolate in the winter, but in the summer, it's pretty nice. <laughs> you know, have some tuna, some oysters, get yourself a new, get yourself a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and uh, we can rock and roll. Um, yes, I like the fish. Um, I also like the sail. Um, anybody know sailing, you see the binnacle here. This is a pretty big vessel. Um, this is 60 on the deck, 72 from pulpit to stern. So um, for those of you who are endodontists, I took Dr. Kim and her friend all around Nantucket Sound a couple of years ago. We had a great, great time. Um, anybody know who this is? This is John Coyce. And John's a really very well-known perioprosthodontist. And John and I were classmates at Penn. I was KOC, John was KOI. So I've known John for 44 years. And we were both um, keynotes at a dental town meeting back in 17. And I sent this to one of our classmates and the classmate had such a great response because she said, neither of you have changed one iota. <laughs> right. uh, so this is, my, this is Dr. Kim, my endodontic mentor, kind of in the summer having some fun uh, on my house. So let's go back here where this starts. The entire story of bioceramics started when I left the Air Force and I went back um, to endodontic training at Penn. There was a man there, a brilliant man, George Stewart. And George Stewart was both a, a periodontist as well as an endodontist. And he was the first person I had ever invited to Harvard as a guest lecturer. And I invited George to come up, and I never called him George. To the day he died, I always called him Dr. Stewart. And the reason I had Dr. Stewart come as the first lecturer was that he was such a gentleman. And that's one of the things I really like is treat your profession with dignity, okay? And be professional. You absolutely have a right to disagree, but don't be coarse about it, be professional. So Dr. Stewart was amazing. You may know him as the person who invented RC prep, right? He invented that, but he never patented it for things he didn't want to uh, basically restrict the use. So he avoided royalties. He also created an instrument that most people never heard of, but it's one of the most fabulous instruments for getting into calcified canals. This is an instrument called the Stewart Probe, and it's a specially tempered metal that allows you to get into it. You can actually move dentin with this probe. It's also so sharp, if you drop it off your bracket table, it will stick into the floor. So don't wear sandals, okay? It's a very sharp instrument. So what happened was that when I went back to endodontic training, I was appalled at the way that program there was just killing these teeth, particularly in the coronal third. And what George was doing, George was working with glass ionomer. And at the time up in Philadelphia, in North Philadelphia at Temple, uh, Sam Seltzer, who's one of the giants in Endo, had a young resident, Herb Ray, and they did a study where they filled the entire root canal with glass ionomer. That resulted in a great seal, but it was just about impossible to retreat. So what George started doing, George started using a single cone in conjunction 
with the glass ionomer. That made it easy peasy to retreat, and it was also easy at delivering the material. So I knew glass ionomer very well from restorative and pros. So I started working with George, and what I was using at the time was a product out of Europe, out of SB called Ketac Endo. It's a glass ionomer cement, and I started doing all kinds of cases. And this eventually led to me to do a leakage study, which is really kind of cool. And what I found out with the leakage study was, was that the glass ionomer would go into all these webs and fins. And I could drive it through with one single cone, which was pretty amazing. I ended up doing a research project with a, a friend of mine, Phil Min, and we ended up publishing it in Triple O. And there are a couple of things here to be gleaned from this. And, and thanks to the iced tea, whoever brought me the iced tea. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when I did this study, like a lot of research projects, I had an expected result. I thought that glass ionomer was going to show to have a better seal than Grossman cement. But understand, Grossman cement at, at Penn is like, you know, it's, you know, her heresy if you go against that. So I did this study and I compared Grossman cement lateral condensation and single cone versus glass ionomer lateral condensation single cone. Well, the best result I had in terms of the seal was with the glass ionomer, no surprise. But what was interesting to me was with the, the Grossman cement cases, single cone had less leakage than lateral condensation. And, and when I published the results, People thought, oh my God, you made a mistake. You screwed this up. You must have fudged it. I said, no, 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 wait a second, not at all. And I said, listen, here's what the truth is. What lateral condensation is, you put a single cone in. Then you take a spreader, like a D11T. You work it down 14 millimeters. You take a fine, fine cone, butter some a sealer. It goes down that same channel, 12 millimeters. You now take a D11T, work it, it goes down 12. The cone goes down 10. Take the D11T, goes down 10, the cone goes down eight. So what lateral condensation honestly is, is a series of cone, cones in a sea of cement with a whole bunch of voids. Does it work? Absolutely, it works. But what it is, it's a series of cones in a sea of cement with a whole bunch of voids. So when I did this, I realized, wait a second, there may be some credence here to using a single cone if we have the right shape. Pardon me for drinking. Kind of feel like a farm animal here. <laughs> so we published that. Then what happened was that I left Penn, so I go up to Harvard. I now have my own program. What happens if a school doesn't give you a lot of money running a program, they don't tell you what to do. So what happened, I was able to use all my Frankenkoch ideas. So what I started doing, I started doing single cones in the faculty practice with glass ionomer on suspected fractured cases. If the case was fractured and it hadn't gone necrotic and it didn't have a single deep probing, single cone glass ionomer worked. But if I got the case that had already gone necrotic or if it had a single deep probing and single deep probing is pathognomonic for a root fracture. So if you're probing a tooth, four, five, five, four, six, what's that? That's periodontal disease. But if you're probing and it's two, 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 eight, two, two, single deep probing is pathognomonic for root fractures. If I had a tooth that had a single deep probing or gone necrotic, the single cone glass ionomer did not work in any case. Also, you have to understand, I'm doing this in Boston. Boston is the only city in North America where people get carotid distension talking about root canal obturation, right? It's the truth. In those years, Tufts only taught lateral condensation. BU only taught warm vertical. I taught lateral, warm vertical, single cone glass ionomer, and even some chloroperture. So I taught everything. But, you know, in Boston, you know, they love pups. If you're an endodontist and you don't get pups, you don't get any referrals. If you're in Kansas City, Missouri, and you get pups, you never get another case sent to you. So there's a lot of geographic things in terms of evaluating you know, the pups and x-rays. Now, I kind of like pups. I like apical patency. This was a student case. Now, what is this? Anybody know what this is? 
It's actually sealer coming out this fistulous tract, right? Now, that's what I call a puff, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And that's, that's actually really pretty funny. Uh, this ain't so funny. This is good news and bad news. Um, good news was, because I measured it, it was a nice dense fill of 15 and a half millimeters. The bad news, of course, is in the mandibular canal. This was a young woman. She was actually a Japanese woman going to school at Boston University as an undergraduate, had two uh, root canals done downtown, two premolars, and then afterwards had paresthesia that developed into paresthesia and pain. So um, well, she shows up on my table. Someone said, the endodontist over there speaks Japanese, which I do, and I see this. I called the dentist. The dentist had no x-rays anywhere near the apex. And of course, the dentist had used a lentulo spiral to drive the cement into the canal. Um, this is really a nightmare. And I've seen too many cases like this. Um, Harvard Dental School in conjunction with Mass General Hospital is the nerve injury center in America. If somebody has anesthesia, dysesthesia, paresthesia, you name some kind of a seizure related to implant surgery, oral surgery, and endodontics, at the end of the day, the place they end up is at Mass General and Harvard. So I've seen a lot of cases. It was a result of implants or oral surgery. Dr. Donoff, who's the dean, is an oral surgeon. He would see the patients. But if it had anything to do with endodontics in terms of sealer based or surgical applications, Bruce and I both saw the patients. Um, this is totally negligence. I mean, how could you put so much sealer into the mandibular canal? And I said, what did you think it was going when you were using the lentulo? I mean, that's a lot of sealer. Now, these kind of cases, the way they're treated, thank God, that's not me. That's an OR case with an oral surgeon. And what they do is they unroof the canal and they lavage out the excess sealer. The problem is the IA looks like, you know, London broil after being exposed to endodontic sealer. Residents are the worst. This happened to be um, actually a zeolite-based sealer. So what happened with this young individual, this young woman, she was scheduled uh, for a procedure with Dr. Donoff at the general. She went back to Japan and she never came back to Boston. So this is a king that can be completely, completely avoided. I don't like taking lentulos to the end of root canals and you have to be able to take x-rays and see the apex of the tooth. At this time, in this period, which was really in the mid 1990s, these were the kind of sealers we had available. We had ZOE based kind of stuff like Grossman cement. We had a KO based sealers, CRS, uh, Sealapex, those type of sealers. We had epoxy resin cement, um, for instance, AH26. Uh, I would not let my residents use AH26 because of the paraformaldehyde. If you like epoxy resins, and I don't, but if you do like them, I would recommend that you switch over to AH+. Uh, they've taken out 99% of the paraformaldehyde, and that's the problem with the 26. And then we had the glass on them with cements. So this is what we had in terms of using sealers. So I love this picture. When I think of lateral condensation, this is what I think of, right? Look at this. It looks like spaghetti. What would be the sealer of choice in this case? Marinara sauce. <laughs> Yum. All right. All right, so let me, let me talk about a little bit of some of the things that are going on. Also, in this point in time, there are heated gutta percha techniques were being introduced to the general dentist. Endodontists know how to do this, but this is not such an easy technique for the non specialist. So, basically, what would you do? You'd fit a master cone, burn out a lot of the gutta percha, and hoping not to dislodge the apical portion, and then you'd backfill it. And my ex partner actually used to refer to this as killing one bird with two stones. Because what are we doing here? We start off at this, we now introduce heat, and the one thing we forgot to tell you from Boston about heated gutta percha is, is that when you use a heated gutta percha technique and it cools, it shrinks. Anybody know how much it shrinks? About seven, eight percent, okay? So here we're introducing heat, we're gonna burn out the gutta percha, hopefully without dislodging the apical portion, and even if we do it right, we have it like shrinking. And then we've got to go back in using a gutta percha gun, either a Optura, which is heated beta phase gutta percha, or ultrafil, which is heated alpha phase. But what have we accomplished? 
Doing it on the right side is a lot more challenging than having a single cone, plus it's a lot more expensive. So to me, the one thing when I went back to endo school that stuck with me was what's creating a seal? Not gutta percha, gutta percha just takes up space. What creates the seal in a root canal is the sealer, okay? So I'm looking at this whole thing of how can I change around this concept? So one of the things here was that I'm very proud to say I had the first postdoctoral program in a country to use full shank rotary files. The first rotary file ever used was the light speed, and that was used at the University of Texas San Antonio by Bill Wildey and Steve Senior, X S or F Air Force guys. But the uh, light speed looks like a gate screen, and the tip is actually an oil drilling tip. They're from like Texas, Oklahoma. And the light speed tip is an oil drilling tip. The only difference is it's not cryogenically treated. In the oil drilling industry, they, they take the tips, they all put them in the cryogenic tanks. So that was 1992. Up in Boston at Harvard in 1993, I was the first postdoc program to introduce full shank rotary files. And I was using a profile. So this was a case I remember. Patient came in from Brookline into the faculty practice, had two thermophil uh, metal carriers. They're very easy to take out. You take a heat source, ultrasonic or a touch and heat system B, put that on a metal carrier, let it sit there for a couple of seconds, it plasticizes all the gutta percha around it, grab a hemostat or a Steiglitz, pull out that metal carrier, retreat it like a regular GP case. So this woman came in, you can see some of the resorption. So I prepared the tooth, I took a cone length picture, and I look at this. And I look at this x-ray, and the reason I saved it, because that's when the light went off of my head. And the light that went off of my head was like, oh my gosh, it is black and decker dentistry. Because what I realized is that if you use a rotary file with a constant taper, you can create reproducible, predictable shapes. Reproducible, predictable shapes. So when that lady left, what I did was I took a single cone and used some key tack endo and did it on my bench top. And lo and behold, I filled the delta. So at this point, I realized, uh-huh, if we have endodontic synchronicity between the preparation and our master cone, we're going to develop hydraulic forces that's going to move the sealer laterally, and apically, we've got hydrostatic forces periapically. So I realized, wait a second, we can actually fill teeth with a hydraulic condensation technique. So this was back in 1994. So what happened there was when I, I, well, I left uh, Harvard after a while, went out to Densply for a couple of years in Tulsa, created the whole education thing. And as I started working with rotary files more and more, I realized, wait a second, I think we're gonna be able to create a technique where we may be able to get a monoblock. And so when I created Real World Endo, as I said to you earlier in the uh, Entrepreneurial Woman, one of the first products I created was the, the Enhanced Get a Purchase. But what I realized at this point, because of constant tapered rotary files, I could get predictable, consistent, reproducible shapes. So if I know the shape I'm getting, all I've got to do is laser verify my paper points and gutta percha and things will match. So then I got my gutta percha. So now I've got a stiffer gutta percha to deliver the sealer. I then got it so that everything here was laser verified. So suddenly, I'm getting endodontic synchronicity. This is totally reverse engineered from the prosthodontic end result. If you have consistent reproducible shapes like you can get with a constant taper, I can, and I have years ago, created a prefabricated custom post because I know what the shape is gonna be. It's so easy when you live in a world of a constant taper. So at the same time, I was developing these other products I talked about earlier about the smear clear. Now, why is this important? Let me show you this. So here's smear clear. This is 5.25% sodium hypochlorite for three minutes. Let me bump this up to 2000 power. And it's a totally what you would expect. Organic tissue has been removed because sodium hypochlorite has organic tissue dissolution capabilities but the smear layer is totally intact because that's inorganic, totally predictable. Let me show you about some of the um, EDTA products on the market at the time. 
Hope Den out of Boston, Howard Burke's company, great company, does an okay job. Uh, Brassler of all companies used to sell a reduced EDTA. That looks pretty good there. But let me tell you, you can fudge SEMs. Depending how you section the SEM, you can make it show it things that really don't exist. But let me show you what smear clear look like. When you see this many tubules, you know you're up near the CEJ. So when you blew this up to 2000 power, when I got this back from the SEM lab in Orange, California, and I was living at the time in Irvine, California, I went crazy when I got this image back. And I had my partner take a look at it, and I said, Dennis, take a look at it. It's amazing. He goes, yeah, it does a nice job of removing a smear layer. I said, no, you're missing the entire picture here. When you can condition the inside of the canal wall like this, if I'm using glass ionomer, I'm going to get a chemical bond to the inside of the canal wall. Now I'm also going to get a mechanical bond. I'm going to get real pegs here. So I said to him, you know what this image means? He said, no, what does it mean? He said, we're I said, we're going to change obturation. The restoration of the tooth begins at the apex. I can bond obturation out to the inside of the canal wall. So the restoration of the tooth begins at the apex. Okay, so that really took me into a whole nother place. So now what I'm realizing, okay, we've got, you know, kind of stiffer gutta percha. We've got laser verified gutta percha paper points. I've got an EDTA enhanced solution that I think is going to help me bond to it. What do we have going on? Instead of filing and filling, we have milling and matching. Lateral condensation, series of cones. Uh, vertical condensation, I love the homogeneity. I don't like the shrinkage. And initially, when we had sealer-based techniques, what we were thinking about was that the thicker the layer of sealer, the more prone it was a dimensional change, i.e. shrinkage. But that's going to change. But at this point, the synchronicity had a very thin cement layer. This is what we were looking at. The other thing was, at this point in time, I ended up creating a whole line of instruments. And these, of course, were constant tapered. So now what I'm getting is I'm getting shapes that look like this on a molar. My big thing here is preserving the coronal third of the root and making these easy techniques to reproduce. But here's what I'm looking for. At the time, we had two types of popular sealers. We had epoxy resin and we had glass ionomer people. Poxy resin has a great bond to gutta percha, no bond to the canal wall. The glass ionomer had an incredible bond to the canal wall, but no bond to the gutta percha. I love resins in aesthetic dentistry. I love the color stability. They don't do well in moisture. They're hydrophobic. Glass ionomers do great in, in moist environments, particularly sub-G. What you do is you basically make a little incision with a 15 blade, back off the tissue, put a clamp on it, isolate it with a rubber dam, do your prep, fill it, take the clamp off, take the rubber dam off, put that little tissue back. You don't even have to suture it. Done, have a nice life. So easy working on a sub G, okay? So what I decided to do was I'm going the route of glass ionomer. I'm gonna to try to get a monoblock between the canal wall and the gutta percha cone but I've got no bond with the glass ionomer to the gutta percha. So what do you think I did? I took glass ionomer and where do you think I put it? Put it into the gutta percha. And I found that you could put it in up to 10% without changing any of the physical characteristics of the GP. So I put it in, it's a proprietary thing, but it's a little bit less than 10%. I then went up to Canada and I visited with a manufacturer and I met with a person who owns a coding patent. That's Dr. Yang. He's a material scientist at UBC. He owned a coding patent. You know what his coding patent was on? Coding cardiac stents. And he was coding cardiac stents with antibiotics. So my partner and I paid a visit to Vancouver, Canada. We met Dr. Yang and his partner, uh, Dr. Tom Janovich, also a material scientist. And we met him in a really cheap Chinese restaurant in Vancouver. It was like linoleum floor type of place, right? And Vancouver's got so many fabulous Chinese restaurants. We met in a really cheap one. 
So I sat down and I explained to him, um, I said, are you familiar with gutta percha? He said, of course, I work in a good dental school. I said, what I want to do is I want to put glass on him into the gutta percha. He said, not a problem. And I said, I know you have a coating pattern. Can you coat this cone at a thickness of less than one micron? That's nanotechnology. So he said, yeah, no problem. I said, what do you mean no problem? He goes, no problem. I said, have you ever done this? He said, no, but no problem. And he was absolutely right, no problem. But then he said to me, you're using the wrong material. I said, what do you mean? I, I, the patents are all provisional. He said, the world's going to bioceramics. So I said, well, let's use bioceramics. He said, it's not ready. I said, what do you mean it's not ready? He goes, I can't get the particle size down small enough. So I said, I want it so I can push it through a tuberculin syringe. I want the particle size less than one micron. I said, that's gonna take me three years. So I made a decision with my partner to introduce a technique called active gutta percha as a precursor. Why? Because I knew we were gonna take enormous flack and get clubbed by our fellow specialists. They were gonna feel threatened by the concept of a single cone hydraulic condensation technique. So what we did, as Dr. Yang was refining the particle size of bioceramics, we introduced active gutta percha. So what active gutta percha was, the goal here was to create a technique that created a mono block from the dentinal wall all the way to the cone or the carrier. This is Dr. Yang when I was over in China. He was the material scientist I worked with both in the GIC and the bioceramics. This is the coding. I literally have no idea how he does this, but it's so good that you can't see any kind of gap on an SEM. I can bend it 90 degrees and I can't delaminate the coding. Again, this is his proprietary technique. I have no idea how he does it, but it's exquisite. So what we did is I redid all the George Stewart leakage studies. I also sent teeth to Houston, Texas to the lab that works with NASA, the space agency, and they sent me back fluorescent metallographs. You can see this, you can see the gutta percha with the glass ionomer, you can see the glass ionomer particles in the sealer, and you know what you're looking at? You're looking at a monoblock. That's a monoblock. There was a competitive company using a thing called uh, Pif uh, Re uh, Resilon Epiphany, that's a resin, and they would show a little pie section of a monoblock. Nonsense. I'm showing you the whole tooth. Resins don't do well in moist environments. Okay? So this was the monoblock from the active gutta percha. I, I got hundreds of these fluorescent metallographs. I also realized when used with a synchronized tapered preparation, it's going to go into the fins. This is the fins. So the material was flowing into the webs fins and nastamosis. What was driving the hydraulic forces was the synchronicity of the fit between the gutta percha cone and the preparation. Same type of, I love, I love doing leakage studies because they're very cool to show slides. And here it is another premolar. Here it is going into the fin. More importantly, take a look at this. Anybody know what this is? That's what we call a delta. And this is a nightmare. We see deltas on the apex of mandibular premolars. We see deltas on the palatal root of maxillary molars, and sometimes on the distal root of mandibular molars. This is really challenging for endodontists. When I'm looking at the clear teeth, I realize the forces is driving the sealer material into the delta. All right, what would I rather have in a delta? He did get a percha that's gonna shrink when it sets, or a non-shrinking sealer. I'm going for the non-shrinking sealer, okay? This was the glass ionomer. So this was really, really a, a big jump for us in terms of looking how this is gonna work. I even had a, a knockoff on thermophil. So what I decided to do, people who like carrier-based, I'll make a carrier like thermophil, but it's all active gutta percha. And then we invented a transporter that would deliver the instrument. This is the transporter. So if somebody was using um, thermophil or some kind of core carrier, this would facilitate insertion of the carrier, especially in the posterior part of the mouth. So this is what active gutta percha looked like. I love it. It's so simple, right? 
again, look at the coronal third. Here's one of my ex-residents, Dr. Nasa, who's, who's replaced me as CEO and president. That's a beautiful case for like single cones glass with the active gutta percha. But what I want you to look at is the canal cap. Why is that so important? A lot of times people are having root canal therapy done and it exhausts completely all their insurance money. So they're not getting the tooth restored in a proper and timely manner. All temporaries leak. That's why we call them temporaries. But the way that you can prevent these people from losing their entire root canal that you just did is that if they're not going to get the tooth restored in a proper and timely manner, place a canal cap. Burn out one, one and a half millimeters of gutta percha in each canal. Place in a glass ionomer, a resin modified glass ionomer. You can put anything that you want in there, but what that's going to do, it's going to act like a manhole cover and prevent leakage if there's leakage coming in from the chamber. So if the patient loses their temporary at the Wendy's, they're not going to contaminate and lose the root canal. Uh, a number of schools now have started to embrace this. It's really a smart idea if the patient is not following along with the continuity of care. So now here comes active gutta purchase. So I've had all kinds of different wheels and these wheels are idiot proof. You can't spill anything out of the wheel and everything is laser verified. So what happened, we went for about two, two and a half years and we, were, we had some really interesting sales and people were starting to adapt it when all of a sudden the bioceramics was available. That was an immediate shift right over to the bioceramics. Why is bioceramic such a great material? Well, in terms of the sealer, yeah, the sealer comes pre-mixed. You don't have to mix anything. The particle size is less than one micron. You can put uh, any type of tip on this, a tuberculin syringe. You can put a, a 0.31. It's going to still go through that type of bore size. But what makes bioceramics interesting to us in endodontics basically are the properties associated with it. In terms of the materials, the key things I want you to understand is that it's basically made up of calcium silicates, calcium phosphates, and what it does through a hydration reaction, it generates hydroxyapatite, big deal, okay? But in terms of physical properties, here's why we have a bioceramics. First of all, you can pre-mix it. That's, a, that's really a big help. It's antibacterial. What do I mean by that? The pH of bioceramics is 12.8. Where did you ever hear 12.8 before? What material? Calcium hydroxide, okay? So in, a, in addition to uh, organic tissue dissolution capabilities, calcium hydroxide is a strong antibacterial, pH 12.8. So is bioceramics. Here's a huge deal. It's hydrophilic, not hydrophobic. In fact, what makes a bioceramic set is moisture. And it's the moisture from the dentinal tubules that makes the sealer set. By weight, what percentage of dental tubules is water? About 30 to 40%. And it's the moisture in the dental tubules that's driving this reaction. Again, it forms hydroxyapatite. And when bioceramic sets, it doesn't shrink. In fact, it expands 0.3%. So think about this. What's creating the seal is the sealer. <clears throat> Anybody here a chemistry fan? Not really. <laughs> so this is a hydration reaction. And what it does, it spins off water. If this was a Coca-Cola reaction, it would spin off Coca-Cola. But in addition to that end product, what's the thing before it? Anybody know what that is? That's hydroxyapatite. So what this instrument, what this material is basically, it's basically a bone cement. And that's what they're using over in Europe. In many instances, they're using bioceramics as a bone cement. So how do we use it? Well, you can actually put it on a slab and mix it up and, and place it like you use your regular sealer. Or if you have some magnification, certainly any endodontist with a microscope, we take it halfway down the canal and then we slowly back our way up out of the canal, up out of the tooth. Again, now we have BC coated gutta percha. Coated, everything laser verified. So here it is in a, in a block. 
So about halfway down, we're just gonna back it out slowly. Anytime you extrude material and you back out, you do this slowly to prevent air bubbles. So now I'm gonna come in with a, um, a size cone that's gonna match this simple little prep. But look at the hydraulic forces because of the synchronicity and match. That's how it works, okay? So now you've seen this here on a, in a block. Let's take a look here in a, a scan. This is from Adam Lloyd at the University of Tennessee, Memphis. I love showing this, it's really a pretty cool looking scan. And then you can see because of the wetting angle on the bioceramics with, associated with the bioceramics, it flows really, really well. So we can see here through Adam's scan, how this material is going into webs, spins, anastomoses. Now, let's show another example. Look at that. This is Alex Fleury in Dallas. Look at the delta he has on the powder of the maxillary molar. Looks just like the cleared tooth. It's quite common in endodontics. This is one of my favorite videos. This is Ollie back in Boston. He had a case, third molar, suspected fracture. He filled it, turned out to be fractured, so he had to extract it. You can see that it has a casting. I think the tooth was fractured before the casting. That's why they put the casting. Anyway, when he extracted it, he decided this was a great case to section because he had filled this C-shaped canal with bioceramics. So here comes Dr. Nase. He's now starting to work from the apex back up to the CEJ area. You can see there, there's a, a master gutta percha cone surrounded by sealer. What's going to be amazing to you as he gets up to the CEJ. This is the true C-shaped canal. It looks like a horseshoe. A lot of C-shaped canals, you have the uh, mesial um, buckle and the distal connected with a separate mesial lingual, but this one here, all three are connected. But look at the way this material has bonded. Why? Because it continues to lay down the hydroxy appetite. And at Penn, we have found out that after three months, it doesn't make a difference with a coated or non-coated cone because of the hydroxy appetite that's being generated. In the first three months, there's a little bit better seal with a coated cone. After that, it's no different. So how does this work clinically? Here's a case, a pretty easy case. Not that easy, but pretty easy for a premolar. Bayonet-shaped canal. The way you do that if you're a general practitioner is initially use your rotary past the first curvature, then use O2 hand files to get the back curvature, come back with your rotary as a finalizing file so everything matches. So Ollie went in, did the case, that's his length film. We use apex locators and take an x-ray. Apex locators only show you the length, x-rays show you the anatomy. Um, Ollie's done more biosomic cases than anybody uh, in, on, in this universe. So he does a, use it with the microscope. This is too deep for me. I want to see the seal at the mid root, not in the apical third. It's not that critical. So Ollie goes ahead and he finishes the case. So if I show this case to an uh, experienced dentist, you know what they say? Yeah, that's okay. It's a, it's a nice case. It's, it's okay. It's kind of like, now, it's, it's, it's a good wall. It's not a great wall, right? It's a good wall, right? So you think this is an okay case? Let's move your cone head 15 degrees. That's awesome, right? That's an awesome case. Not only is that preserving the architecture of the root canal system, it's conservative in the coronal third of the tooth, okay? So this is what we have. This is my thing here about endodontic synchronicity. This happens to be a 4004 instrument. I'm creating a reproducible, predictable shape. I can match the shape from the 4004 with a laser verified paper point, laser verified master cone. I can create a prefabricated custom fit post that matches perfectly. There's your buildup. He said to me, what's the best post drill in the world? It's your last rotary file. You know, there's plenty of endodontists who've done more total root canals than me. My former partner did probably 40,000. I've done maybe 21,000. But there's no endodontist who's done more crown and bridge than I've done. I've probably done 10,000 crowns, okay? So I understand this. You're looking at an endodontist here who understands the Shimstock paper and a Stewart articulator. 
So this is truly endo-restorative, an endo-restorative continuum. How would you like to have this come into your office at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon? All right. So what you do is you take the post out, get into the get you're into the canals. You just have to re-instrument them, fit them, boom, done. Have a nice weekend. Okay. Anybody into arachnodontia? Right. This is a, looks like a spider, but what we're doing with this type of technique, we're preserving the architecture. What happened? in the 90s and early 2000s, because of this push for thermophil, carrier-based operation, for this push for warm vertical, which is not easy to do, to make it easier, people started opening up the coronal third. They started using orifice openers, 0.12. What happened was that obturation started dictating shape. That is completely wrong. What should dictate shape is the natural architecture of the root canal system, okay? Now look at this, look at this cross over here with the spin. The more you clean this out three-dimensionally with the use of ultrasonics, the more you're gonna fill these fins. But if I was sitting in your place, I would think about this. All right, Dr. Koch, you said it's non-resorbable. But what happens if I get an overfill? Is there gonna be a problem? That's a great question. This lady, uh, Cheryl Ullman, was a year behind me at Penn and she did her endo at BU. She practices and has practiced for many years in Rutland, Vermont, has a great practice. So a few years ago, I saw her at the Yankee, and I like Cheryl, and she's a friend. So I said, hey, Cheryl, I've been using a bioceramic. I fully expected her to give me a gushing answer. Instead, she goes, yeah, she said, I used it on a case and I got a big overfill. Well, if you said you had a big overfill, that's one thing, but a BU trained endodontist, home of the puff, said they got a big overfill. Trust me, it's probably a schmear, okay? So, so she said to me, uh, I get this big overfill. So I said to her, pretty cavalierly, don't worry about it. It's like a bone cement. It's going to heal completely fine. I expected her to be like, okay. Instead, she kind of had an attitude. She said, no, what I'm going to do, I'm going to send you the x-rays. And she walked away. Okay, have a smoothie, you know? But the thing here is like, you know, this was the thing. I'm going to send you the x-rays. So here's the x-rays. Upper left, pre-op. This was immediate post-op, Okay. There it is four months later, okay? It's a bone cement. We have a gazillion cases where people have overfills and it, and it basically heals. It's a bone cement. The only way, just like MTA, if you put this in a material that's so moist, it's not allowed to set, like up in the sinus, then it will resorb. But any other place, it, once it sets, it's not resorbing. That's why you can do this as a single cone hydraulic condensation technique. So what do we have? Endodontists don't like to do things too easy. They feel threatened by the general practitioner. So they still want to use backfilling techniques. That's just the truth, okay? So we had to create different gutta percha, and now we have backfilling gutta percha with a different heat, uh, a lower temperature to accommodate those requests. And now even Steve Buchanan, now Steve Buchanan, Steve's gotten on board the bandwagon and he's put some in, in things. And Steve suggested changing it so he could use it with his warm vertical. Absolutely fine. I'm thrilled. Also what Steve doesn't mention here, what we did with this also, we added zirconia. So why do I say we added zirconia? For even more enhanced radial opacity. Take a look at this, okay? What you have in this case here, it's a place of the case, then it's filled, okay? So it's an area on both roots. Look at the area, you see the third molar. There's only one problem. This guy forgot to go to the dentist, okay? But what happens, look at how that tooth is totally bombed out. Take a look at the periapical area. It's totally healed. So what does that tell you about the sealing capability here? It's an amazing seal. That's one of the things that you guys, on a sidebar, I can do a sidebar, right? Okay. She's gonna say no, right? <laughs> when you guys have, the night, biggest nightmare case for an endodontist is the chronically left open tooth. And these are people who always sadly don't have any money. And so what happens, they blow up. They go see Dr. A, they get a prescription for penicillin. 
They do great for six weeks. They blow up. They go to Dr. B. They get a Pacillin for Amox. They do okay. They blow up again. They go back to Dr. A. Eventually, let's say they come into some insurance coverage or money. Now they want to have the tooth restored. Fabulous. There's only one problem that all of you guys are making. You're not checking for furcation caries. A lot of these cases are cariously involved in a furcation. They're not restorable. So you really have to evaluate before you initiate root canal treatment or you send it out, is the tooth restorable? So obviously this one was a goner. Huh? It's a pretty good example of the sealing capability. Now, how strong is the seal? This is in one of uh, Steve's true teeth. Okay, and um, and Ollie put this in. So let's see. This is a plastic thing. It's not as retentive as a tooth. It's not the same type of bonding. Can you pull this thirty cone out? Gotten a little dramatic here in the video, but what do you think? Breaks it off at the office. So that's how strong that seal is. There's another problem. If you're using a sealer that's resorptive, it's not just going to resolve on an overfill, it's going to resolve at the interface between the cement no dentinal junction. That's where the root canal ends. The root canal ends at the cement no dentinal junction. That's a problem if it's resolving. Take a look at this case, right? Look at this case here. This is one of my ex-residents. You can see where the gutta percha ends. I don't have a, a laser here, but you can see where the gutta percha ends. The bifurcation is filled with sealer, okay? 2005. Look at the recall. The recall is a, not a recall. It's because the tooth has failed. It needs to be retreated. Do you see the bifurcation with sealer? No, because it's resolvable. That's not a good case result. Instrumentation was fine, wrong material for the sealer. Look at this one here. Look at all those little broccoli things at the end of the root. You know, people like myself, we show you cases with all kinds of lateral canals, all kinds of cauliflower stuff, and we get excited, including endodontists. But look at it. A couple of years later, there's nothing there. That's not the way it should be. Here's another one. Sherman works with Steve. Sherman's a Harvard graduate. But take a look at this case. He's got all these fireworks. You know, a lot of endodontists, especially anybody who trained in Boston, when we get this firework of, uh, you know, lateral canals and pups, we get excited about that, right? Look at that. Oh my gosh, everybody, take a look at my x-ray. I'm a superstar. Then all of a sudden, take a look what happens. One year later on a recall. Firework show has been turned off. There's nothing there. Okay? So this is why the fact that bioceramic sealer is non-resolvable, the fact that it actually expands 0.2% is a big deal. Look at that. Look at the look at the power of that. And the Sherman was nice enough to share that extra with Ali and myself. And he's a good guy. So let's talk about surgery. This is upside down. You're looking at a mesiobuccal root of a maxillary molar. Uh, where do you get the hemostasis in apical surgery? You get it from your anesthesia, okay? Uh, what we're doing there with a little bit of ferric sulfate, we're using that in a crypt for some additional hemostasis. But what you're going to do in this mesiobuccal root, you're going to use an ultrasonic, just like we do to create three-dimensional um, acoustic streaming. And you're going to clean it out and then come up with the ultrasonic and make a retro prep. So in just a second, you're going to see this come in here. This is a three millimeter tip. We make the section of the root four millimeters up from the apex. We go up another three millimeters with the tip. So that means we're seven millimeters up from the initial apex. Okay, now we dry it out with a strop go. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna fill it. So how are we gonna fill it? Simple, with bioceramics. Here's a syringable technique. Just syringe it right into the retro filling. Get a wet cotton, a ball, get a big guy, not the restorative pellet. Just go right over that, wipe it clean, put the flap back, done. I love the repair putty. What's the difference between the sealer and a putty? The sealer particle size is less than one micron. 
the putty is a little bit between one to one and a half microns in size. When you increase the particle size with bioceramics, you quickly, you shorten the working time. The working time on a sealer, that's four hours. With regular putty, it's two hours. And with fast set putty, where we made the particle size a little bit bigger, it's 10 to 20 minutes, okay? It's just like if anybody here knows you're all too young, but maybe you had your mom, you heard your mom talk about it, Juvederm, all right, and Restylane and HA fillers for aesthetics. That's all about cross-linking. The more you cross-link it, the longer it stays in the tissue, the more you can manipulate it. So in our world, it's particle size. So here's the fast set putty. Again, as soon as you place it in, you can go in and restore it. There's a couple of things here that we use this for that you have to have. One of the issues here is we're starting to see success with pulp caps even in um, uh, adults and pulpotomies, but you have to have a case selection. But how do you do a pulp cap on, on a patient? First of all, the first thing you have to do is establish hemostasis. That's not so easy to do. Uh, pulp caps, when you, you're trying to do a, an exposure, they really bleed easily. So you can use a bunch of like peroxide on a tuft of cotton, you can even use a, a little bit of sodium hypochlorite. The first thing I do is I take a spoon excavator and I want it to be really small and really sharp. And I just excise a little bit of that inflamed tissue and you literally hear the pulp go and it sucks back into the chamber. Sucks back in the chamber, I go on top of it with my peroxide on the cotton pellet, hold it for about 45 seconds to a minute, I've got hemostasis. I then take the fast set putty I put it right on top of that exposure. You don't even have to give it 10 minutes or 20 minutes. You put the fast set putty on top of the exposure. Then I, what I want you to do is I want you to take a glass ionomer and you now take the glass ionomer and you put it on top of the putty and it will bond. The glass ionomer will bond to the bioceramic. Then I want you to etch the glass ionomer and then you can fill it with whatever material you want. Done all in one visit. That's called a sandwich technique. Fast set putty, glass ionomer, etch the GIC, put your restorative material, done. The only way that's going to get easier, we're just about ready to introduce it. We're working on a product called endo restorative material. It's basically a bioceramic restorative material with some resin added. So the way that technique is going to change, what you will do is get hemostasis, place the fast set putty on the exposure, put the ERM material directly right on top of the putty, done. Okay, but until that comes out, I want you to put the GIC on top of the putty, etch the glass ionoma, and then restore it. So how many fillings do we have? I think every general practice out in the uh, civilian world should have a, a tube of this because you need it for emergencies, perforations, pulp caps, all that kind of stuff. And there's basically 22 servings in one of these little things. So right here, what we're doing is we're taking out the things and there's 22 individual servings in a, a tube. We're gonna skip a little bit on the perforation. So let me go to this. So what do we have here? This is again, another surgery case. Take a look at that. Patient's a little nervous. Take a look at this. This is, this is a great one. This was a case a couple of years ago. If you had this happen, you know, people would say, oh, this needs to be a fixture. Now, what's really kind of interesting to me was with the implant guys, they would quickly say, oh my God, both roots are failing. You better take this out and have an implant placed unless it was their wife. <laughs> and that's a joke of my endodontist because the dentist will call you, hey, listen, can you save Judy's tooth? Wait, you're the, you're the implant guy. Why don't you extract that? Well, cut the shit. Can you, can't you save our tooth? Yes. Take a look at this, okay? You get a big post. It's failing on both roots. You could say, I need to take it out. Uh, not so quickly. Let's do some microsurgery. There it is, immediate post up. We've got our bioceramic putty placed, right? In the mandible four months later, okay? People are lucky because you don't have a postdoc program. 
So you're getting a thorough endodontic education, not just clinically, but what endodontics can do for people. I've seen three great things in my 40 something years in dentistry. Number one was non-metallic dentistry. When I went to dentistry, we had silicates. Anybody here, faculty members, remember when we had Adaptic? When Adaptic came out, big deal. It was a big deal, red and blue things. So non-metallic dentistry, number one change. Number two, implants. Implants are incredible. They're a great uh, alternative and they're a great indication for use when properly used. Remember years ago, I put a couple of implants in, put a Doldemar, I got stability and mandibular dentures. But the third great change was the introduction of nickel titanium rotary files because it gives us shaping we could only have dreamed about with hand instruments. So now putting these things all together, this now really kind of works. A couple of quick things here. That's the new chairman down at Penn, uh, Bakir Karabukashek. He's really, really an incredible guy. And um, on Wednesday morning treatment sessions, think of how lucky he is. We have the residents. He's the chair of the department. He's got Dr. Kim, Dr. Trope, and myself. So you have three people there who acted as chairs and directors of postdoc programs. Nobody messes with Dr. Kim. <laughs> Dr. Trope is very academic. And I try to broach both of them, I try to bridge it between both of them. But, but Vakir is great at handling that whole high powered mess. And he's just an incredible gentleman. That's some of the people in China. So anyway, let me show you something real quickly here. This is a, a study, <coughs> excuse me, pardon me, by uh, Me Too Coley. Me Too was a resident, now is practicing in South Jersey. And she compared the color stability with repair. So she compared root repair material, pretty good result in six months. Root repair material, fast set, looks good. Biodentine by Septodont looks really nice. White MTA ain't looking so good in six months. Gray MTA looks even worse. AH plus, which is a epoxy resin, that looks fine. Try antibiotic paste is what we use for revascular cases. That's a disaster. And then we have the control. What's causing the staining with the MTA is not the bile ceramic. It's the bismuth oxide. Bismuth oxide is used as a radial pacifier in MTA. With the bile ceramics, we use barium sulfate. And now we're starting to add zirconia. So the best thing about pulp caps, don't use a syringable, use that fast set putty, and that'll work really, really well. So what this whole thing is really about, it's about shaping, filling, and restoring the tooth. And that's the kind of stuff we wanna avoid. <laughs> so again, shaping, filling, and restoring the tooth. Any questions about bioceramics? Absolutely. Okay. Let me tell you a couple of things here. If you have a, a young mature tooth and it's necrotic, we do a procedure that's called apexification. If you have a young mature tooth that's vital and you remove the pulp from the coronal pulp, the apices are still open, and then you place a pulp cap there with the bioceramics, that's gonna work and the roots are going to close. Where did the cells come from that close the apex? They come from the PDL. But pediatric dentistry has enormous applications for bioceramics. It's a great, great uh, thing for these guys and women. And of course, with pediatrics being so emphasized recently because of the ACA, we have a lot of people going to peds. We have a lot of work being done. It's absolutely fabulous for pediatric use. Yes. Yeah, no, it's really pretty easy. The first thing that we do with any of this stuff here is that you can go with an ultrasonic and, and make a little bit of an access up top. Secondly, what we like to do, and this is why we use a cone, I like to run a file at an increased rate of speed. You can take a rotary file, I'll take an endo sequence file, you can run it anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 RPMs. You run down into the curvature, so maybe that's 16 millimeters. That's going to plasticize and auger out the GP. At that point, we put in chloroform, and then we can continue down with our rotary files again, 
but at the regular speed of 500. Any place there's a blockage or if anything is hanging up in the wall, the instrument to remove any type of bonded sealer is an ultrasonic. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I don't, I don't necessarily know if they would do that. I, I really honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, people use things off label for a lot of different things, uh, particularly with uh, pharmacology things. In terms of smear clear, I don't know. The thing with smear clear where the thing off label that was really generating, but it really wasn't off label as it was a side aspect, is that it not only removes the smear layer, it's a potent antibacterial agent. We have time for one other question. Okay, we need a really good final question. Let's see if anybody has the nerve to ask one. What's the best gin? <laughs> oh, Hendrix, Hendrix and Tonic, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we go, we have a couple of gifts for you and a presentation to thank you for everything oh you've done. We really appreciate oh, thank it. You. Thank you so very thank much. <laughs> Again, words cannot express our appreciation. We have a certificate of appreciation to Dr. Anne Lauren Koch in recognition for your contribution to the education for health professional, for health profession students and providers in the field of patient care and inclusivity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. Can I, should I open it up? And there okay. is no sign out for CE. So thank you all. I'll, I'll that Sorry out. about that. You don't have to stand in line. Have a great weekend, everybody. Okay, thank you so very much. I hope you learned something today. Okay, yeah. All right, perfect. That's great. Thank you, Michael, so much for your help. All right. I'm going to jet. It has been a distinct honor to have met you. Are you kidding? I have the, the pleasure is mine. What you're doing here, Steve, is amazing. I hope to connect with you some other time in the future. You do. I love it. I will. And I have this.